So, welcome everybody. Hello. Uh, I'm uh, Pierre Joffard. I'm, I'm not going to say much, but just to uh, welcome you uh, to this uh, place. Um, so, the, 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 the topic of this, uh, this year workshop is uh, individual and collective preferences. And uh, why is it an interesting and an important subject? Is, uh, is something that, of course, will be discussed by uh, presenters. But it's uh, um, when we think about why is it it's, it's important to, to design some tools to assess uh, individual and collective preferences. This, the question is not asked in in, in situations when there's a, a private market, when there's a, a, a well-functioning market, because then the 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 we learn about preferences from individual decisions of whether or not to buy a different good, a specific good at a, a given price, and that's probably enough information to judge about efficiency of the system. Not equity, so it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, such an organization may raise some uh, equity issues, but in terms of efficiency, at least we know that the individual decision by the individual who, who, who takes the decision is probably, the, this individual is probably the best judge uh, to know what is good for him or for her. I know that, you know, in health economics, this is also a debated issue, whether individuals are the best judges uh, to evaluate their own welfare. Um, but, it's, uh, but at least it's a reasonable assumption for many goods. Uh, whereas when we have some public goods or some publicly provided uh, private goods, so, so there's, we need to have collective decisions uh, whether or not to cover a given drug by, um, uh, by an insurance, especially by a social insurance company. Then we need to have some measure of uh, to say whether or not uh, this will be good for individuals who are going to assess that, and that information cannot be inferred from the purchasing decision uh, of the individual. So that's why we need other tools uh, to, to evaluate that. So not entering any more in details, uh, I would like to give the floor to James Hammett, who will, um, who will talk for, uh, can, you, can you, 45, 45 minutes. Um, so, uh, James, if you want to uh, in maybe introduce yourself or, or, uh, it's, uh, or introduce the topic. So, thank you. So, uh, James Hammett. So, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm a professor of economics and decision sciences at Harvard where I'm also head of the Harvard Center for Risk Analysis. And I've had the great good fortune to be affiliated with the Toulouse School of Economics for about 10 years now. Um, so the topic I was given is the topic of the conference, public decisions versus individual preferences. And what I'm gonna talk about in particular is the challenges of valuing health risks. So what I wanna talk about is first public decisions, private preferences, and normative models. And in particular, I'll talk about economic models of how we should choose and what insight they can give us. Then I'll turn to valuing health risk in particular. And what I wanna focus on is our two standard measures of health risk, which are quality adjusted life years and money measures, which I'll generally refer to as willingness to pay and ask the question, if we want some way to evaluate a measure of preference for health risk, how could we evaluate whether that measure is a good measure or a bad measure? And then having proposed those criteria, I wanna talk a little bit more about qualities and willingness to pay and what we know theoretically about how they behave and also how they compare one with the other in theory and empirically and uh, stack that up against our evaluation criteria. So let me begin with this little parable written by Paul Portney, who was a very prominent environmental economist several decades ago. So think about this. You are the director of environmental protection for the community of Happyville. And all the residents of Happyville, 
are a little bit unhappy because there's a naturally occurring contaminant in their drinking water and they think it causes cancer. And there's a way to clean this up in the water treatment plant. It would cost $1,000 per person and everybody in the community says, I'd like you to clean it up and I'm willing to pay my share. But you go to the scientists, the risk analysts, and they say, well, you can never absolutely be certain about health risks, but I'm as sure as I could be that there's absolutely no risk associated with this contaminant. And you've communicated that skillfully to the people of your community, and they still say, well, you know, that's all well and good, but I still just would feel better if we'd clean this up and I'm willing to pay for it. So what do you do? You can either uh, go along with the public preference, clean it up, and be quite sure yourself that you've wasted $1,000 per person. Or you can say, no, you know, I know better, science knows better, you are in error here in your preference, and so I'm going to save you the money, you will be better off. And maybe someday they will agree that you did the right thing. So that is kind of a great... Uh, sort of a nice encapsulation of the problems we often face. And the point here is that our behavior as individuals, as members of the public, often differs from normative models of how we ought to behave. And here I'm thinking mostly of economic models. And so when our behavior differs from the model, is that because our behavior is wrong? Sometimes that's right. We all make cognitive errors. We tend to be susceptible to what's called the framing of a problem. If you describe the same problem in two logically equivalent ways, you will often make different choices. Of course, advertising is a lot about this, trying to frame choices in a way that makes you more likely to buy the product than not. Um, there are also problems of self-control. Most of us procrastinate. On the other hand, sometimes the model is wrong. The model is always an oversimplification of reality, and sometimes it's too much of an oversimplification. It leaves out things that are important, like important attributes of the outcomes to people. In risk analysis, we often try and quantify things just as the expected number of fatalities, but people might care differently about dying from cancer or in a road accident or in some other thing. So ignoring that fact would be an oversimplified model. And models, of course, have idealized assumptions. One of the most important of simple models being the assumption of perfect information and perfect information processing. But that leads to the concept of rational ignorance. So the very simplest economic model assumes people have complete information and complete ability to evaluate situations. Obviously, that's wrong. But under that model, any kind of health and safety regulation or even product standard at best is just a waste of effort. It does nothing because people have perfect information about the risks and all the attributes of a product. And if those standards ever influence people's behavior, they reduce their welfare because they're preventing some people from choosing a product that they rationally uh, would choose. But of course, information is costly to acquire, to collect, and to think about, to process, to decide what is the best action to take in the myriad of behaviors we make every day, products we consume, food we eat, et cetera, et cetera. So given this, it's perfectly rational for people to be ignorant about the exact properties of many, many things we consume and do, and to delegate to government or to industrial groups or to others, the task of collecting information, figuring out what would be good safety standards, for example, and enforcing those. And this also has the implication that because we rationally are not perfectly informed about things, when information is disclosed, it can be counterproductive because if we don't use it correctly, we can overreact or react in some uh, way that actually is harmful 
like we overreact to selected attributes of products. And for example, you all know uh, a product that's described as natural is perceived as one that's unnatural and, or synthetic or artificial. Even in cases where there's absolutely no scientific reason to think there's any difference in the properties. Okay. So that leads me to what I think of as some of the fundamental questions about social policy, which are um, first for the individual, we'd like to kind of do the most good for the most people or something of that nature. So first, what is good for a person or for a household or for a family? Second is the distributional question. Almost any time we make a choice, we adopt a policy that benefits some people at a cost of either harming other people or at least not benefiting those other people as much as we could have had we made some other choice instead. So that leads to this question of how do you decide whether a benefit to one person justifies foregoing a different benefit to a different set of people. And then also, what's very important, I think, is the ex-ante, ex-post distinction, before and after. So in healthcare, obviously, when people are born and don't yet know what diseases they will develop, they might sort of have preferences for a healthcare system that would have treatment for a wide range of diseases. Once they get some particular disease, they have a very strong preference to have a good treatment for that disease and don't care so much about treatment for diseases that they didn't get and have no chance of getting. And one way to think about the before and after perspective, I think, is the idea of two things we care about. One is equal opportunity. We'd like people to have kind of equal chances in life to have good outcomes versus equal outcomes we don't like it when people suffer bad outcomes. We'd like to help those who, through whatever reason, suffer you know, an illness or poverty or whatever. And this also, so these two things are somewhat in conflict, or can be. And also, it raises the question of kind of liberty to choose and responsibility for choice. Because if we care a lot about opportunity and letting people make their own choices, do we also then hold them responsible for the choices they made and for the outcomes of those choices or not? So if we really care about equal outcomes, then perhaps we ought to restrict people's choices. We should not let people do things that with high probability will harm them. Okay, uh, what's good for the individual? In economics, the conventional answer is the idea of consumer sovereignty meaning, as was just suggested, that the individual is the best judge of his or her own well-being and how different uh, products, healthcare interventions, and so forth will alter that. But that's, of course, only one conception of individual, of what's good for the individual. There are many others. Uh, Amartya Sen talks about capabilities. Bob Sugden about opportunities for fulfillment. John Rawls, the philosopher, talked about primary goods. Uh, many religions have their idea of what is good for an individual. In healthcare, we often talk about quality adjusted life years as another measure of what is good for an individual. And then, as I've talked about, so that was the individual level. At the distributional level, there's this question of how do we decide when a benefit to some people justifies foregoing a benefit to others. And in neoclassical economics, it's been assumed for a long time that there's no objective way to tell who gains more from some intervention, who suffers more from the same kind of pain. So we typically adopt standards, but they're arbitrary. So one standard is money. It's the idea of uh, potential Pareto efficiency, the Calder-Hicks compensation test, is that a society is better off if the people who gain from a policy gain enough, the money value of the gain to them exceeds the money value of the loss to the people who are harmed, so that in theory, 
the people who win could pay money to the people who lose and all would be better off. So that leads to the idea of benefit cost analysis. When we use quality adjusted life years, there's the standard that a quality counts equally in the social calculus regardless of who gets it. So policy provides two qualities to one group and at the cost of one quality to some other group would be counted as a net gain even though there's absolutely a harm inflicted on the second group. Um, I find this distinction useful, normative versus revealed preferences. So normative preferences represent the agent's actual interests. So that has to do with prescription. If we were prescribing how an agent should act, we would say he or she should act in accordance with his or her normative preferences. Revealed preferences are just um, whatever rationalizes the actual, the actions that an agent actually takes. So we have many studies in economics that look at people's behavior, assume they act in their best interest, and from that infer what their interests must be, their self-perceived interest at least. So for policy evaluation for social welfare, I would argue that what we want is the normative preferences, which are informed, thoughtful, um, reflective, they're considered, they're not kind of spur of the moment gut decisions that could be heavily influenced by cognitive error or other factors like that. So that leads to the questions, if we can estimate preferences of an individual or a group, how can we determine whether those are good or plausible estimates of their normative preferences? If they're if these estimates are good at predicting the way the people will behave, then they are unambiguously good measures of their revealed preferences and that they describe behavior. But is that behavior itself consistent with normative preferences or is it suffering from these various failures like framing effects, procrastination and the like? And then also if we determine the estimates we've made are that these are not really uh, normative preferences, should we somehow adjust the preferences we've estimated and in the extreme just replace them with some objective function uh, chosen by some philosopher or some other expert? Okay, so how could we judge validity of estimates of normative preferences? Uh, one idea is we should look for consistency with some theory of normative preferences, and that is these estimated values should be sensitive to things that we argue should matter. So if you get a bigger benefit, that should have higher value than a smaller benefit. That's sometimes called sensitivity to scope. Um, and they should not be influenced by things that we think should not matter, like logically equivalent descriptions of the same problem. If they lead to different answers, then that should cause us to say at least one of these answers is wrong and quite likely both of them are. When we do surveys, experiments, what's called stated preference, sometimes you can compare that with estimates from revealed preference studies, but then you have to also address the question whether the estimates from the revealed preference are themselves normative or not. Okay. And then for evaluating methods of health valuation, it seems to me like in terms of good for the individual, we would like our measure of value to be consistent with the individual's preferences. And in terms of the trade-offs among people, we would like our measure to be consistent with the way we want to aggregate across people or make trade-offs between different people's well-being. And there's some inherent tension among these various criteria. All right, the standard measures, as I mentioned, and as you know, are money measures, like willingness to pay for something, which is often used in, in evaluating environmental and transportation projects, and then quality adjusted life years, disability adjusted life years, and related concepts often used in 
many areas of public health and medicine. So in terms of the extent to which these measures are plausibly consistent with individual preferences, qualities impose a law structure. And the conditions associated with that structure seem to me kind of reasonable, plausible, but there's strong empirical evidence that they're violated by people's own preferences. They may be kind of okay on average, but they're mostly wrong for most individuals. And also they measure only health. There's a question of what is health. Some measures of health talk about like social function, ability to play a role in society, which is much broader than like physiological health you might think of. And of course with mental health, you know, it's hard to know where to draw these lines. So money measures like willingness to pay are virtually unconstrained. So they don't impose these strong assumptions, but that comes at the cost that if we're confused about what our normative preferences really are, the money measure will uh, not help us in avoiding these errors. It will measure whatever preferences we express, logical or illogical. Okay, so I'll say quickly, I think most of you know about quality adjusted life years <coughs> where they integrate the quality of health and the length of time spent in different health states. So the value of a change in health risk is the expected value in a probabilistic sense of the change in qualities. Um, Trade-offs, so they measure health versus time or health versus longevity and they assume implicitly that that does not depend on other attributes of your life, like your income, your wealth, your consumption level, your family structure, and many other things. So that's a strong assumption that's just embedded in it and not often recognized. Um, and then, of course, they don't address the trade-off of how important are health and longevity relative to the other things money could buy, like consumption, education, housing, and so forth. And that's led to a large literature trying to estimate the money value of equality, which I refer to as the Quixotic quest because I don't think there is such a thing as the value, as I'll show you later. Okay, so qualities are the product of Q, which is the health-related quality of life, measured such that a value of one is the highest possible value, and that corresponds to full health. Zero is a health state that's as bad as being dead. You could have Qs less than zero, reflecting health states that are worse than being dead. And so it's just the product of this Q times T, the duration of the time spent in different health states. If qualities are consistent with individual preferences, meaning they represent somebody's individual utility function, then that person would have to prefer a situation that gives him or her more qualities or more expected qualities than the alternative situation. And the theoretical conditions under which this is true were published in 1980 by uh, Joe Pliskin, Don Shepard, and Milt Weinstein. And the key assumptions boil down to these. That the Q, the health-related quality of life, associated with some described health state doesn't depend on how long you're in it. So one way to say that is if 40 years in good health is just as good as 30 years in excellent health, where I'll assume good and excellent are clearly and well-defined, then it follows that four years in good health are just as good as three years in excellent health. This is called constant proportional trade-off of time for health quality. Also, the quality of life of health associated with the health state doesn't depend on what health states you experienced before or after. So the fact that you've recovered from something worse or that you've deteriorated from something better doesn't influence the weight associated with a particular health state. Then the other point is that it's proportional to time. It's linear in duration, which implies that individuals have to be risk neutral over lotteries on time 
So for example, if you had a 50-50 chance of being sick for two days or not sick at all, you would have to view that as being exactly as good as being sick for sure for one day, because expected value of 50-50-0-2 is one. Um, so in terms of this risk neutrality, there's been uh, some study here which suggests most individuals are not risk neutral on length of life. I think often it's the case we tend to be risk averse for kind of long longevity, risk seeking for short periods of longevity, which I think is perfectly uh, rational. There's no problem with that. Um, in principle, you could have a ver uh, modification of qualities that accounted for this preference for risk seeking or risk aversion on length of life. And these have been developed, but then the problem is because it's not a linear function of time, if you want to compare between people, you no longer have equalities, equalities, equalities. It's not clear how you would add across people. So you give up a lot of the um, simplicity. And of course, in practice, we discount qualities, which is a, implies a, a very precise degree of risk aversion corresponding to whatever discount rate is used. So I mentioned the theoretical paper laying out these conditions was published in 1980. Qualities were kind of invented in the mid-70s or so. This paper by Barbara McNeil and colleagues was published the next year. And this tried to elicit utility functions in the context of cancer of the larynx, when there were, there were two treatments available. One was radiation, which didn't work very well, and the other was surgery, which worked better, although still poorly. And the consequence of surgery is it would be removing the larynx, and so the patient would lose their normal ability to speak. So what these two curves show is utility is a fact a function of the years of survival, up to 25 years, and as a function of whether one had normal speech or had lost the ability to have normal speech because of the surgery. And these curves violate all the assumptions of qualities because first, they're not linear in time, so they reflect pretty strong risk aversion over length of life. In fact, you can calculate from this that for normal speech, if you had a 50-50 chance of living 25 years or zero years, that would be just as good as living about four and a half years for sure. So that's pretty strong risk aversion. And the other thing you see is that the health-related quality of life associated with losing normal speech depends on how long you'll be in this state. If you were to live 25 years, without normal speech, that would be as good as about 15 years with normal speech. So you'd give up 10 years out of 25, roughly. If you were to live only five or six years without normal speech, you'd give up practically nothing to have normal speech. So um, kind of almost from the start, we've known that qualities are not a good measure of individual preference, and I think We've just chosen to ignore that because we say they're intuitive, they're practical, they have advantages. And so we don't want to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Here's some more evidence on risk posture that, um, let me just mention at the bottom, there were uh, two studies, one done by uh, Jitten Nielsen and colleagues at the University of Newcastle and then one done by Tubitunsel and myself in France, where in each case we presented to people their chance of <coughs> surviving each of the next 10 years. And then we altered those survival curves in a way that increased their life expectancy. And we did it in different ways. In each case, in our study, we increased life expectancy by about a month in total either by increasing the chance of surviving the next decade or by increasing the chance of surviving all future decades by a constant additive amount or a constant proportional amount. And so if you were strictly risk neutral, all these lotteries on life expectancy that have the same, I mean, lotteries on longevity that have the same life expectancy would be equally good to you. 
and in our case, in a survey of about 1,000 French, 23% expressed risk neutrality, that they were indifferent among these three perturbations. About 30% were either consistently risk averse or consistently risk seeking, evenly divided between those two categories. And then the other half the people expressed different patterns. And in fact, about 85% of respondents gave responses that were at least internally coherent. So it's not just noise. Okay. Okay, let me turn now to money, willingness to pay, which is just the rate of substitution between whatever we're valuing, like health and longevity, and money, your wealth or income. And we value changes in health or risks over health. And theory really constrains us very little here, I think. I already mentioned the idea that your willingness to pay should be larger if you get a bigger benefit. When we're talking about risks and small changes in risk, the theory is pretty strong that your willingness to pay should be proportional to the change in the probability of a bad outcome. So if you could reduce your current mortality risk by one in 100,000 or by two in 100,000, you should pay twice as much for the two in 100,000 risk reduction than the one in 100,000. Now, if we want to figure out an individual's preferences between money and qualities, one thing we can do is assume that the person's preferences for health and longevity are consistent with qualities, and then ask what is their utility function for health, longevity, and wealth, where the wealth can be spent as they wish. And the answer is that their Q is my measure of qualities, or it could be a generalization of qualities. And then this total utility function has to be the qualities multiplied by A of W, which is just some function of wealth. And then you could add some other function, B of W, to that. And A has to be positive, so that your utility increases if you have more qualities. So, we could look at how does the marginal utility of health, uh, I'm sorry, of wealth, uh, what's implied about that? So my first line is the equation I just showed you. The second is what's the incremental utility associated with an increment of wealth? And A prime means the derivative of A with respect to W. It's a conventional shorthand. So, notice the when, so Q is future qualities. When you're dead or about to be dead, Q is zero. And then what we have left is just the B term, which in the mortality evaluation literature we think of as a bequest function. The utility you get from passing on your wealth to your children, your favorite charity, whoever it might be. And then, so A prime tells us how does the marginal utility of wealth differ if you are surviving versus dead? And so the conventional assumption is you get more utility from your wealth if you're alive than if you leave it as a bequest. So that would imply A prime is strictly positive. But that also tells us now that the marginal utility of wealth is strictly increasing in qualities, that is, in your future longevity and your quality of health, which is um, the idea that the marginal utility of wealth increases with health is a pretty standard assumption now, and at least for big changes in health seems pretty plausible to me. And also that it increases in longevity is plausible because the longer you live, the um, more opportunity you have to spend your wealth if you have a long life expectancy and you're very poor, you obviously have to be very, um, uh, very careful in your spending. Okay, so from that, we can figure out what's the marginal willingness to pay for a gain in quality, and it's this formula in the middle, which shows you that Q is in the denominator. I've just argued that A prime has to be strictly positive. 
So that tells us your marginal loans to pay for quality is a decreasing function of how many qualities you have. It's a diminishing marginal loans to pay, which is not surprising. But it also tells us this idea that there's a constant value per quality just doesn't make sense theoretically. It will depend on how many qualities you have. Okay, let me um, wrap up with some empirical estimates here where I've done a couple studies with a colleague, Kevin Hanninger, who um, was a doctoral student at Harvard when we did this work. And these are surveys in the United States using a large nationally representative internet panel of high quality. They're state of preference surveys where we presented people with a choice Basically, there was, in one study, there was a risk of being sick for a short period from uh, eating contaminated food. And you could be sick for a day, three days, or seven days. And then there were three levels of severity. We elicited, we described the severity of people by the symptoms, and we elicited from them what they thought the health related quality of life associated with that state would be. And then we elicited their willingness to pay to reduce the risk of getting this episode of foodborne illness. The other study involved chronic illness, where the duration was a month, a year, or the rest of your life. And we described the illness to people by the EQ5D profile, one of the standard measures of health classification. Now, so I mentioned we want to evaluate the validity of these estimates. And so here, my test would be that willingness to pay for these small changes in probability should be approximately linear in the probability change. Willingness to pay should be larger to reduce the risk of a severe illness and to reduce the risk of a long-lasting illness. It should also be increasing in individual income, which it is, and I'll bother to show you that. And it should not be sensitive to things that we think should not be met, should not matter. So in the foodborne illness study, we, for two thirds of the people, we said this is your risk of getting sick from one meal if you buy this food versus that food. For other people, we asked them how many times per month do you eat this food? And then we scaled up the risk reduction and the price. So we said this is your risk of getting sick in a month. So just logically equivalent trainings. Um, so here, the model I'm thinking about is if willingness to pay is proportional to the expected change in qualities, willingness to pay should be equal to delta R, the reduction in risk of getting ill, times delta Q, which is the, <coughs> the severity of the illness, the reduction in health of life if you're sick compared with your current health times T, which is the length of the illness, and then delta, alpha, beta are exponents. And if you take the law, you get a linear equation. So if willingness to pay is proportional to the expected quality change, those three Greek letters will all be equal to one. And those are the coefficients we estimate and test whether they're equal to one. <coughs> okay. Let me um, not give you too many details here. This is the description of the severity of illness for the foodborne illness case. And so the first one, just read what's in red, says um, basically you're sick, but it doesn't prevent you from going to work or doing your regular activities. The second, upset stomach, fever, painful cramps, diarrhea, you can't do your usual activities. Third, you're admitted to a hospital, you have severe diarrhea, you're dehydrated, you have intravenous tubes. So clearly these are very, very different levels of severity that everybody understands. This shows you a measure, well, two different measures of health-related quality of life. Current health in the first row, so in the left column, is about 0.8 with those mild symptoms. Health quality of life falls on average to 0.5, so loss of 0.3. The moderate health quality of life falls to 0.25, and the severe to 0.1. So people are clearly distinguishing 
<coughs> and then when we run the regressions, the first column shows you and highlighted in red are the coefficients I'm most interested in. So the first coefficient on the log of the risk reduction is a half. So that says people are willing to, willing to pay more for the bigger risk reduction, not in proportion as they should be, but significantly more. And interestingly, the effects of duration and of severity are about 0.2 and 0.1. So they're statistically significantly positive, but they're nowhere near one. And interestingly, they're a lot smaller than the coefficient on the risk reduction. So that's puzzling because the risk here was on the order of chances in 10,000 per meal. <coughs> so people don't really know the difference between 3 and 10,000, 2 and 10,000 at an intuitive level. Clearly, they know the difference between the severity levels. Clearly, they know the difference between the day and the week. But yet, okay, so our estimates are not so sensitive. And then here, if you use just a subsample where the risk was described per meal or per month, coefficients are basically the same. So suggesting the results are not sensitive to that framing effect. Chronic illness, um, as I said, we described results by the CQ5D system, described the illness, did something quite similar. And here, in the first column, now we see the coefficient on the log of the risk reduction is like exactly one. So perfect proportionality to this risk reduction. But the coefficients on severity and duration are again much, much smaller. And they're pretty close to the coefficients we had in that other study. Severity about 0.3, duration about 0.1. And the right-hand column is where you combine the duration and the severity just into the qualities. And now you get willingness to pay rises with the qualities, but with an elasticity of 0.17, not 1. So to put all this together, um, this table, I'm showing you just some calculations. Uh, so in the left-hand column, delta Q, the severity, is either 0 0.1 or 0 0.9, which is kind of like the minimum and the maximum. The duration in the top half is one day or seven days. That's from the acute illness study. Below the line, it's one month or 40 years, which is the rest of life for the average respondent <coughs> from the chronic illness study. The next column shows you the elicited willingness to pay for these risk reductions, which are range from like $1.30 to $2.50 for the acute illness. And then $79 to $350 some dollars for the chronic illness. Then the, the value per case, which is just the willingness to pay divided by the probability change. So this is analogous to the value for statistical life, but for these non-fatal illnesses. And what we see here is, so take um, above the line, the 0.1 one day, so very mild illness per day, the value per case is $6,800. Seems like a lot, mild illness per day, right? The severe illness, 0 0.9, seven days, is 12,900. So even though it's nine times as bad, seven times as long, so 63 times as many qualities lost, the value per case we've elicited is only order of magnitude twice as large and similar effects in the bottom part of the table. And then in blue, what I've shown is when people are trying to figure out the money value of a quality, they often <coughs> take some estimate of the value of mortality risk and prorate that over the years of life for the future qualities that are lost from death. And so they assume willing to pay is proportional to qualities lost in that calculation. And if you do that, you get the corresponding implied ones to pay implied value per case. So to go back to the, the mild one day and the severe week, the one day illness on the, that calculation is worth $130. The uh, severe week long illness is worth 8,000. Those do differ by a factor of 63 by construction. <coughs> 
So this is kind of the pattern. This uh, very weak sensitivity to duration and severity says that the willingness to pay and the value per case of mild illnesses and short illnesses is almost as big as the value per case of severe and long illnesses. And so the question is, is that normative or is that not normative? And if it's not normative, do we want to go with something like Follies and say, no, no, you guys are wrong. You really do, should be much closer to proportionality in how you value duration and severity. Um, so let me just close with this. I think this is an example of a classic problem. And here I quote from two great statesmen of old, Thomas Jefferson, who wrote, so like in their answer to the question of trouble and happy bill, what should you do? Thomas Jefferson wrote, I know of no safe repository of the ultimate powers of society, but the people themselves. And if we think them not enlightened enough to exercise their control with a wholesome discretion, the remedy is not to take it from them, but to inform their discretion by education. On this side of the Atlantic, the uh, Irish English statesman Edmund Burke wrote, your representative owes you not only his industry, but his judgment. And he betrays you instead of serving you if he sacrifices it to your opinion. And obviously, we are critical politicians who do all these polls and focus groups and base their policy on trying to stay in front of the crowd. We don't really think that's leadership. But we do want them to pay attention to what the public wants. And so it's a typical classic problem, and I think I'm going to set our problem today in the context of this larger question. Thank you.